Welcome once again to the DRH show. Today I'm joined by the founder of Ad Council and Orchestrate Health, Paul Flynn. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Dennis. Nice to be here. Well, it's great to have you here, Paul. So let's first talk about your background, your trajectory in life, and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Great. Oh, okay. So um, I am a business person who has been working uh, in the mental health field now for about six years. Prior to that, I was in the recruitment industry and um, with uh, a colleague of mine built a, a successful recruitment business uh, called Staff Group. And uh, we sold that in uh, 2015. Uh, I live in London and um, I'm uh, uh, a Midlander. I'm from Leicester. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's very much me. So let, let's talk about your career trajectory. So you said that you moved from the recruitment sector to mental health. Um, so I, I suppose you have kind of like an insight when it comes to mental health support being integrated into the recruitment process. How do you think we can effectively implement that? And what, what are the ways, what are the process that we can use to better serve job seekers and candidates? Okay, so... Um... Moving job is one of the most significant life decisions that we make um, up there really with, you know, moving house and uh, getting married. So it's, uh, it's all very often a, a very anxiety filled type of experience. And, uh, you know, as a recruiter and the art of being a recruiter is having the kind of skills and, the, you know, the empathy and the ability to support people in making these decisions uh, and ensure that they feel supported in doing that. And um, I think that's very much something that lies at the heart of people who are, are good with, are good at working with people. And uh, I think that's very much um, a, a very, very important component, not only in recruitment, but also in mental health practice. And I suppose this is at the forefront of services that you offer in, in Ad Council. So, so what kind of services do you offer and what kind of clients do you help? Okay. Ad Council is a, a private uh, mental health service, and essentially we treat patients with addictive and mental health disorders, uh, one patient at a time, uh, based on an approach from Switzerland. Um, we, what we seek to do is to uh, wrap around uh, the patient, a very safe uh, and effective team of people, uh, ranging um, from psychiatrists, nursing, uh, the full living support, and what we're able to do is provide, provide what we call uh, a kind of home from home type of treatment experience. Um, as you can probably imagine, it, it comes at a significant cost, um, but it's very effective. Um, and the feedback we get from our clients is you know, universally positive. And of course, Paul, alongside our council, you're also the founder of Orchestrate Health, just like what I mentioned earlier on the intro. But what made you set it up? So what, what's, um, I suppose, what's, what's the unique aspect of Orchestrate Health that you cannot deliver as part of Ad Council? The Orchestrate Health is a community mental health service. It delivers services in people's homes, online and in clinic. And, the, you know, the, the USP in many ways is that we provide integrated care. So instead of just having a psychiatrist or a psychologist or other therapeutic support, we're able to kind of tie them all together, create really effective, clinically evidenced treatment plans and help manage them. And it's that management of these treatment plans over a period of time that provides peace of mind, not only for the patient um, and the family, but also often referring clinicians. And uh, we get referrals from um, other psychiatrists, but also from uh, primary health care, and also step down from a number of private uh, mental hospitals as well. And uh, from my experience, really, I don't think anybody else does it quite like how we do, um, because we're able to draw upon the capabilities of you know, some of uh, the very best uh, mental health practitioners, I think, certainly in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Absolutely, Paul. But can you just give us like a ballpark figure of how many clients have you, you, you have helped? Because this is sort of a, a niche sector. But you said 
um, you, you quite delivered the, the unique um, selling propositions earlier, but um, just, just, just give us a ballpark figure. Yeah, so with regards to Orchestrate Health, we're, we're, we are now treating in the hundreds of people at any one time. Um, and this has, um, this has grown significantly over the last 18 months. Um, initially, it was a response and was developed um, in the pandemic uh, because innovative techniques uh, to support the, the urgent needs of patients was required. And um, what, we're, what we're experiencing, certainly in the public sector, is um, massive resource challenges and mental health um, capabilities, certainly within um, community mental health services and crisis teams. Um, so the number of inquiries that we get a day are um, 15 to 20 inquiries a day. And um, not everybody is appropriate for us. Some uh, involve uh, as referring onwards to um, um, inpatient facilities. But equally so, some people just need a, a standalone therapist. The whole purpose of what we do is being able to provide that full integrated package of care. And uh, we treat a range of disorders. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that only goes to show that there's really a much more, I suppose, like realization that we really need to prioritize mental health, um, not just in the workplace, but of course in every aspect of our lives. But because um, well, when I talk to people um, who have founded um, startup companies um, relating to mental health, it usually stems from their own um, lived experience. So can we just pivot this um, conversation to your life experience, Paul? So how do you think your own life experience can help clients? So my life experience um, certainly helps clients, I think, in two ways, really. Uh, firstly, being able to kind of share um, my experience, particularly with addiction, but also with a depressive disorder and how I was able to uh, overcome it and, uh, and, and certainly manage elements of it. And I think a lot of the coping mechanisms that I've picked up over the last you know, 17 years, um, I still implement today. As you say, uh, managing your mental health um, is important as treating uh, a mental health um, uh, emergency when it comes on and uh, having those um, protective um, techniques is absolutely critical. Uh, on the second side, on the, on, from the second perspective, um, being able to talk about mental health, you know, for a, a, you know, a CEO, a father, a man, uh, to share that at times in my life things have been very difficult, um, but with the right level of support and belief, um, you can get better. And, I, you know, I strongly believe that. Um, recovery um, is, you know, it, it, I think it can be often a misunderstood word, um, but essentially we're often managing chronic health conditions and it's about improving one's quality of life. So, you know, I think my own lived experience, you know, speaks to that very well. Absolutely. Um, let's just go back to, to your experience, Paul. Um, do, do you have any sort of insights on what do you think working in high octane environment and you know like typical work hard play hard sales culture has affected your own mental health and i was also wondering because i would imagine that when you were experiencing those mental health issues um recovery and and health were not really readily available as it is now um mainly because you know we're not talking about mental health um, um a few decades ago Yes, quite right, Dennis. I mean, certainly when I was experiencing my problems, uh, there was no discussion, certainly in the workplace, about mental health. Um, there was um, definitely a work hard, play hard mentality. And I think that comes uh, with uh, the sales environment. I think also many of the people who um, do very well in sales um, can have, um, you know, undiagnosed neurodevelopmental um, or neurodiverse um, uh, disorders and a lot of the drugs kind of speak very much to uh, to that things like cocaine uh, and uh, and alcohol um, but if you look forward now you know nearly it's 25 years this year since I got into the recruitment industry and in the workplace setting well-being um, and 
um, supporting people and being very mindful around things like burnout and boundaries. Um, that's really important. And I think even in my own uh, in my own service, we have to make sure that we continue that dialogue as well, because uh, in the desire to want to help people, one has to make sure that you're taking care of things at home, and that certainly exists in uh, in my company. But we, we have come forward uh, a long way. There's no doubt about that. And I think moving forward, it, um, the techniques and the different systems available to support uh, the workplace, they're definitely improving. And uh, I think that's that's a wonderful thing. Uh, absolutely. And talking about techniques, um, one of the most popular techniques, I suppose, is just engaging in self-care and, and forms of, of, of hobbies. And I realize, um, um, Paul, that you're actually into, you know, dance and music. So how, how did this do um, help you when it comes to recovery? Yes. Uh, so for me, um, I think it's probably been um, mentioned before, uh, dance music, particularly electronic music, has been uh, very important to me uh, in my own recovery and the ability to go out, you know, firstly on a dance floor and uh, kind of let off some steam and connect with music that I love, but also being able to play out um, to an audience is, uh, you know, is, is very important. And I always say um, people should connect with the things that they're passionate about and what they love, because very often that provides them with that uh, uh, level of um, connection. Um, and it also provides them with uh, an avenue really to uh, help maintain uh, their well-being. Um, but I'm fortunate, you know, I've, I've got now, and I've built it up over time, techniques, meditation, mindfulness, yoga, fitness. Um, I have a menu that kind of suits uh, my lifestyle. And um, I think it's important to promote that um, as, as, uh, as part of ongoing long-term long well-being. Absolutely. And I understand, Paul, that aside from your um, hobbies and dance and music, you've also engaged in um, long term education. I'm sorry, further education. So what led you to taking a um, master's degree in addiction studies from King's College London? Well, when one has a lived experience of addiction, um, in many ways, you know, you are an expert. There's no doubt about that. Um, however, um, working around clinicians on a daily basis and and certainly in the role as the CEO I felt there was a need to ensure that I had a level of training and uh, I went to King's College um, you know world respected um, for neuroscience and psychiatry and uh, was able to do a master's degree in addictions and uh, you know what I learned from that is um, um, I learned that Balancing that with um, running businesses is very challenging. And I take my hat off to, you know, the numerous clinicians who continue to do significant research work because it's very, very challenging. Um, but certainly for me, it gave me more confidence in my uh, interaction, both with uh, my team members, other people's in the, people in the field, but also with the patients and the families that come in and uh, seek mine and my, my team's health. And it's something that I'm committed to do. Um, I'm looking at the moment uh, at the doctorate and um, I, I get a sense that probably will be the next thing uh, along the line for me. Well, um, good luck with that, Paul. Um, now, let's talk about um, the importance of work-life balance. Um, so how do you balance your work and your personal life while running multiple companies? You have, you have to make time for the family first and foremost. Um, you know, I have a very simple mantra, really. I have to take care of my recovery. And for me, that's very much grounded in involvement within uh, various different fellowships and various support groups. But also that frees me up both uh, physically, but also mentally to be able to be present and to support my, you know, my, my, my wife and my, my children. Um, and also as well, making sure that I'm in, you know, fits condition to be able to uh, handle, which is at times a very, very stressful um, uh, or potentially stressful um, work environment. Um, like anyone, there are times when I will take on probably more than I should. Um, but I think I've also got a bit of a, like an internal thermostat, I say, that gives me a reminder that I need to be able to kind of step back uh, and get some reflection, talk to some people. 
And I think it's really important to make sure that you've got people around you, um, sometimes paid people, but ultimately uh, close advisors who you trust and you can who can help guide you and you can run your thinking by. And uh, that's definitely central to my to my life. Uh, absolutely. It is, it's really important that we we have a support system that we can rely on. But I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the family, some people who might be watching this, they're, they're wondering um, if, if they could, you know, if you could give some advice um, for anyone who may suspect a loved one is misusing alcohol or drugs. Yes, of course. Um, misuse of drugs is, uh, again, you know, it's, it's a massively subjective um, uh, observation, really. Um, I think one of the key things is always to kind of look at um, why somebody may be uh, using drugs. And if there's been uh, traumatic events or there's been a, a particular catalyst to change in behaviour, then very often it's making sure that they're, they inform themselves um, about what might be happening. And I think being able to provide a very non-judgmental, safe uh, environment for uh, a loved one to talk to you about it is important. I think we've moved on massively in the last 15 years with regards to uh, psychoeducational around uh, drug use. And uh, I think if you look in the past, it was very much just say no, uh, don't do that. Uh, now it's much more about... Um, talk to me about what's happening, much more kind of open and empathetic in the conversation. And, uh, uh, and if, you can, if you can achieve that, I think very often you gain a level of understanding um, about bringing things out into the open. Because I think the, the old saying, you know, nothing, nothing grows in the dark, you know, only grows in the light. And if you can bring it out and then um, hopefully you can kind of unpick sometimes what's going on. And if they need referral to... Um, a mental health professional or a team, then they'll be able to do that. And um, it's very much about looking at that issue around things like shame, um, trauma, and and also making sure that um, you're seen as a safe person that they can talk to. And if you can do that, I think uh, you, you will you'll achieve a lot. Um, very certainly a lot more than um, being um, probably sometimes too direct. Uh, or going in there in a very adversarial way. Um, so that's the guidance I would give on that. Well, I would agree with you, Paul, that we, we really have come a long way when it comes to, you know, uh, um, mental health compared to um, in, in the previous years. But um, how do you see stigma surrounding mental health changing in the workplace? Because we can't deny the fact that, you know, there's still stigma, um, not just in the workplace, um, let's say, for instance, men's mental health. So um, did, do you have any idea how this would evolve um, in the next coming years? Yes, I, th I think we're at an interesting inflection point at the moment because the responsibilities of um, owners or actual companies uh, with regards to the well-being of their staff um, is something that has, um, you know, it's definitely increased over the last you know, uh, number of years. Um, I think the question one has to um, answer is how far should that go and where does the responsibility uh, for the management of one's mental health sit? Um, I think environmentally, I think you can create an environment that is sometimes you know, less stressful, um, putting in support systems uh, for your team. But there is sometimes no getting away that if you work at the front line, of, say in the police force system, um, at a very high pressure, high billing law firm in the city or at where um, you sometimes have to be available uh, seven days a week. Um, the mitigation of you know, risk is quite challenging. It's quite difficult to kind of to provide. Um, so sometimes you get a sense with some providers, it might, they, they might be optically doing a lot of the right things. And that's from an outward PR perspective. But what's really happening internally and where does that accountability um, sit? I think as a uh, as an individual, we have our own responsibility uh, for our well-being and our, and our health. Um, but hopefully we work in an environment and work with people that we can talk to and get a level of support, certainly um, when when we need it. And I think uh, there's a there is a long way to go with that. There's no doubt about that. Um, mm. 
Mm. I'd like to pick up on one point that you, you mentioned earlier that it's, it's also something that you, you, you should do yourself. So, you know, there are lots of charities now, there are lots of resources when it comes to, you know, managing your own mental health. But can you share some tips for individuals who may be struggling with their mental health, but they don't know where to start seeking help? Yeah. Well, um, where I always go to, it's, so obviously own, owning a service where um, is a private pay, mental health service, we get a lot of inquiries from people who um, are not being able to get the support in the public system. Um, and being able to draw on some of the wonderful services out there like Rethink uh, Mental Illness and Mind uh, and, and a number of different kind of digital technologies that are emerging. I think one of the great things is uh, the proliferation of different uh, digital interventions. So I would always, I would look there. Uh, I, would, I would look to speak uh, to other members and friends and ask that question about, you know, how are you? You know, do you experience this? And trying to have that level of engagement. Uh, I'm a very big fan of Mental Health Mates, uh, Bryony Gordon's um, um, organisation that she formed, where, where people go out on walks together. Um, because what this does is it levels, it offers a level of peer to peer support, and I think that's really helpful because it makes people understand they're not alone, right? They don't need to be isolated about about this, and for um, very little money, they can access some level of uh, support. It's not all, always professional support in the, in the traditional form, but it is overwhelmingly helpful. There's no doubt about that. Uh, absolutely. Now, Paul, let, let's talk about technology because you, you mentioned it earlier. So what, what role do you think um, technology um, will play in the future when it comes to mental health care as well. You know, speaking right now, um, there's a lot of conversation about chat GPT and all the AI. Do you think this will have sort of impact with um, the way you deliver mental health services, especially within your, your, your company? Yes, I think um, digital technology and digital therapeutics uh, have got a, a massive role to play going forward. It's been fascinating with chat GPT. Uh, and I know there's other technologies in the states like Wobot. There's a guy called Neil Fogarty in the UK who's doing some work around um, AI psychotherapy. Um, I think in many ways, it's a, a lot of it's, if you look at the way technology is being used at the moment, I think firstly, um, post-pandemic, the use of um, uh, Zoom and Teams to deliver therapy services has introduced a level of convenience that didn't uh, necessarily exist before and I think a lot of therapists have really kind of bought into that as well. Um, but I think going to people's homes and being able to have check-ins online, being able to bring um, technology into the home, certainly for the monitoring of um, people's mental health, is going to play a, a, undoubtedly a big role. Uh, whether uh, it will get to the stage whereby fast diagnosis will be able to be achieved, I don't know about that. I do think the triaging of patients has already been shown um, in the um, in primary care uh, to work with the likes of eConsult. Um, there's no doubt that's going to play a part. Certainly, with making sure that uh, the right pa the right um, patients with the right illnesses get emergency treatment um, in the mental health space. But it's only moving in one direction, as far as I'm concerned. And this is needed because we undoubtedly have a, a human capital uh, shortage at the moment. Absolutely, Paul. Now, I was just interested because you come from a sales sector and sales, you're very um, numbers oriented. So I was just wondering, how do you measure success um, in your work with Out Council and Orchestrate Health? We measure success in uh, Ad Council in a number of ways. Um, patient feedback um, is, is central to what we do. Also, if you look at the number of uh, referrals that we get through um, by um, family members um, and people being comfortable enough to recommend us as a provider. Um, I, I, you know, my, my belief is with this, if you do something that you love, um, your know, financial reward will come. And um, for me, this is about making sure that we create uh, the UK's best premium mental health service. And uh, to do that, um, it's all about, you know, the feedback that you get back. We're not on Trustpilot. We're not on a number of those um, 
kind of services because we like to keep things, you know, discreet and we like to keep things uh, very personal. Um, I have a number of people in my team um, who are responsible just for managing the relationships and just making sure that people feel that they are heard and they are supported. So we tend to have probably much more of a qualitative uh, approach to, uh, to our measurement of success. Yes, I would agree with that approach because it's kind of like um, a more humanistic um, sector. So you yeah. can't really sort of quantify your success. So, um, yeah. Um, but, um, Paul, um, we already learned about Ad Council and Orchestrate Health. And we heard your thoughts about um, mental health and also the role of technology will play in the future. But I'd like to wrap this up with something lighthearted. So I prepared three, okay. um, three quick fire questions for you. Right. And just so we could learn more about you as a person. So, Paul, um, what were you afraid of as a child? Uh, what was I afraid of? Uh, I was afraid of the dark. Yes, mm -hmm. I used to have to have uh, my uh, my uh, the landing light on every night and the door open. Okay. And what is your favorite word in another language? Uh, oh, that's a very good. That's a very good. Oh, uh, salam alaikum. Which means peace be upon you. Okay, and that, that's an uh, Arabic word. Yeah. And okay, if you weren't the founder of Ad Council and Orchestrate Help, what would you have pursued in life? I think if I okay, so I think if I wasn't involved particularly in that field in in the field that I'm in, mm -hmm. um, I think I think I'd probably be um, I'd probably be a therapist. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, which is kind of a bit of a cop out, really, because it's um, it's in the it's in a similar field. Mm -hmm. um, I probably be um, I probably be a, a DJ. Um, okay. I probably follow my passion there and really kind of uh, give some more time to that because it, that's something that certainly gives me uh, um, a wonderful feeling. Absolutely. And Paul, uh, finally, the floor is all yours. What should people take away from this conversation, and what's next for you? Any upcoming projects? I think uh, what I'd like to say is. Um, Help is always out there um, and there are some wonderful people who will give their time freely sometimes um, at, at that time where you might be feeling at your lowest. Um, you know, I, I'm the owner of probably uh, one of the more prominent uh, private mental health services. But it's not it's not always about the money. And I, I always like to kind of leave on this. Um, my wife says our house is like better call Paul. Because if uh, somebody needs some help, they know they can always call you. And, uh, you know, I'll put that out there. If, you know, people are, um, are struggling and finding it tough. Reach out to us or reach out through uh, the site and uh, we'll always signpost you in the right direction uh, if we can't help ourselves. Absolutely. And all of those links will be in the description, not for everyone who's watching. Um, well, Paul Flynn, founder of Ad Council, Council and Orchestrate Health, it's great to have you here on the DRH show. Thank you. Pleasure, Dennis. Thank you very much for having me.